My name is Stan Teplick. I'm an ophthalmologist in private practice here in Portland area. I uh, trained at the Mayo Clinic for ophthalmology and then did some subspecialty work prior to starting up practice. We only do refractive surgery, various technologies that are available today, the most common technology being, being LASIK, the most, most popular outpatient procedure of all time. So the eye, in, in very simplistic terms, is, is like a camera. Light comes through this way, passes through the cornea, the clear, clear surface of the eye, where it's focused along with the lens onto the retina. The retina in this model is orange with little red blood vessels running through it, and the retina is analogous to the film of a camera. So light strikes the retina, light becomes electrical energy. That's the main photochemical uh, pathology of the eye, where light is transformed, the photons are transformed into electrons, which travel through millions of nerve fibers to form a nerve trunk called the optic nerve, which goes to the brain. In the brain, the light is processed into the images that we see. That process is a mystery to us how that works and, and probably always will be. But we do know how the eye works, how the refraction of the eye works, and the majority of the focusing of light takes place when light goes through the cornea. So most of the procedures that we do today have to do with changing the curvature of the cornea. The nearsightedness we call myopia, farsightedness we call hyperopia, and then there's this condition called astigmatism that most people don't understand, but because it has the ism on the end, it sounds like it's a very bad thing or a terrible disease, which it really is not. But we start with nearsightedness, which is the most common condition that we treat. Nearsightedness, the, the problem with nearsightedness is that the length of the eye is too long for the focusing ability of the eye. So the cornea may be too steep as well. So some combination of steepness of the cornea and length of the eye allows light not to reach the back of the eye. So light comes to a focus uh, somewhere in the middle of the eye. And most nearsighted people understand this in, in a way because they know that they can push things closer to their face and see them. When they do that, they're actually pushing the focal point closer to the retina. And at some point they can get a, a clear image. So the treatment for the surgical treatment for nearsightedness would be either to make the length of the eye smaller, which is literally impossible to do, or to somehow change the curvature of the cornea from a steep to a less steep curvature. And that, in fact, is the premise of all the surgeries that we've done for nearsightedness over time. LASIK is not the only one. There are others before LASIK. And the, the treatment essentially is very simple. We reshape the cornea from a steep to a less steep curvature, therefore allowing light to focus naturally upon the eye. Farsightedness is just the opposite of nearsightedness. In farsightedness, either the length of the eye is too short for the focusing ability, or the curvature of the cornea is too flat for the focusing ability of the eye, some combination of those two features. So light never reaches a focus, objects never reach a focus on the retina, they reach a focus on some imaginary spot behind the retina. And of course, there is no such imaginary spot behind the retina, so nothing is really clear to farsighted people, either far away or up close. But most farsighted people understand that their near vision is the biggest problem because seeing up close requires a little bit more energy, and that they don't have that energy affects their near vision. Well, we again, we can't really change the length of the eye, so the treatment for farsightedness is to reshape the cornea from a less steep to a steeper cornea. So we're actually steepening the curvature of the cornea with the laser technology, and I'll, I'll show you how that's done in, in a few minutes. Now, most people who either have nearsightedness or farsightedness or, or not, most people have some astigmatism. Astigmatism is really quite normal. And all astigmatism means is that the curvature of the cornea is not completely spherical. It's more oval-shaped or like the back of a spoon or like a football shape where there's a steep and a less steep curvature. And in fact, it's, it's really more common than not. One would imagine that the way the eye sits in the orbit with the eyelids pushing down on it, that this up and down curvature of the cornea ought to be steeper than the side to side. And that's common astigmatism. And most people, if you measure them carefully, have a little bit of astigmatism. So the treatment for astigmatism is to create a more spherical corneal curvature. So we use the laser to equalize, to steepen the flatter parts and to flatten the steeper parts of the cornea to create a little bit of a more spherical corneal curvature. And this is often done, most commonly done, at the same time as we're treating nearsightedness and farsightedness. So it's generally not a separate procedure. It's included in the treatment of nearsightedness and farsightedness. There's a final condition that we should just mention for, for the purposes of completion because it's generally poorly understood, and that's the condition of presbyopia. So whether we're nearsighted or not, whether we're farsighted or nearsighted or whether we have astigmatism, when we look at something in the, in the far distance and we're corrected, our vision should be at rest. 
when we bring our vision up close, it's going to require a little bit more energy than to see in the look at, look at the horizon. So the lens of the eye actually needs to shape, to, to reshape when we see up close. The lens changes its shape, becomes a little thicker, a process called accommodation. And that accommodation allows light to focus up close on the retina. And it's a natural process which we don't have to think about. However, when we reach the age of about 45 years of age, that process starts to, starts to wear out because the lens becomes a little less flexible at that age, kind of like the rest of us becomes a little less flexible. And at a certain point, generally in the mid to late 40s, the lens will not refocus up close. And at some point, we're going to need reading glasses in order to see up close. This is going to happen to anybody, whether they're nearsighted or farsighted, when they're corrected with laser vision correction at the appropriate age. So, one of the myths of laser vision correction is that you'll never need any glasses again is, is a myth. You will need glasses. You'll need reading glasses at the appropriate age. But generally, we're talking about over-the-counter, drugstore-type reading glasses. So the correction for presbyopia would be to create a bifocal on the cornea or replace the aging human lens with a bifocal lens. Well, we don't have those technologies right now. So generally, there's not a very good treatment at this point in time all technologies are working on some way of adding some presbyopic correction to our laser vision corrections. And at some point in time, we may very well have something for that. But the common, commonly right now, we need to understand that most people will need reading glasses at the appropriate time.